Welcome everybody to uh, this Future Classroom Lab webinar, which has got the intriguing title of What is Collaborative Learning and Can It Be Taught? Uh, my name is Jim Eyre. I'm an advisor with European Schoolnet. And um, uh, our, our webinar today is, is featuring four speakers. And uh, we're going to be hearing from Professor Don Passy from Lancaster University on search and projects around collaborative learning, from Peter Claxton and um, uh, Anoa Marcos from SMART, the work that SMART's been doing with its class, uh, 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 SMART um, te technology, and from Jorgen Holmberg, um, who's a SMART exa exemplary educator uh, who's been using the system. So, Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, hand over the role to you and make you the presenter. So, uh, welcome. And uh, if you'd uh, provide an introduction to the session and then maybe introduce the other speakers as they come along. Thanks very much. OK, thank you, Jim. Can you hear me OK? Hear you perfectly, yes. And can you see me OK? Uh, even better. OK, so I'm sorry about that for the rest of our attendees. So welcome. Um, our, my name is Peter Claxton, and I actually head for Smart Global Training. And I would like to start by really saying on behalf of Smart, and Neil Gaden, our CEO, welcome to this webinar. Thank you for giving up some of your valuable time. It's a beautiful afternoon in the UK today. And I really hope that what this will be will be the start of a collaborative conversation that we will be able to continue past this initial webinar today. So I am really looking on this as a catalyst for collaboration. I'm looking on this as a way that we can start to engage with you and that we can build something together. So what I would like to do is, as Jim has already mentioned, we have several distinguished guests on, but I would like to say that, you know, yourselves as smart, the academics, the teachers, we're not necessarily going to have all the answers to what is collaboration. And certainly, as a member of SMART, we've had the opportunity to be involved in many EUN European school net projects. Um, I think one of the largest was ITEC. And that was a really great example of how we work together with other organisations such as schools, such as ministries, such as commercial organisations. And really, I'm saying that that sort of collaboration is also important for us to answer the question, what is collaborative learning and can it be taught? And that's what we're really going to look into with some great research and some great um, notes from people like Professor Don Passi. So let me... Um, See if I can move the slides forward. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the OECD report and collaboration and how SMART responded to that. And as I say, I'm going to provide you with some ideas, some thoughts that hopefully will act as catalysts. And one of two of them, you'll come back and say, let's have a conversation about that, let's talk about that. So I'm going to go through some very high level um, findings on something that we call teaching technology and learning and understanding the connections. And this is a preliminary piece of research, a preliminary project that SMART has actually been working on. So I would start by saying learners change and schools must. I certainly know the pure panic in my children when I hide the charger for their mobile phones. If I want to get their attention, and 
I think that SMART has got a very clear vision about technology and we are very much about wanting to equip education with the right technology solution to support learning and collaboration in ways that are natural and intuitive to students. And what does that mean? Well, let me sort of step back from that a second and say, in my role at SMART, I've travelled and I've been lucky enough to travel all over the world. And I've seen schools and classrooms from, you know, one side of the globe to the other. And one thing that I really notice is everybody is looking for some magic, some glue that will help solve the education challenges. If you watch just any news station or television or radio, you'll see the stories about education budgets, stories about assessment and attainment. In fact, you know, there's one running on school academies in England on the BBC TV today. And as an ex-teacher and an advisor, so I've actually taught in schools, it was quite a time ago, I actually do believe that governments, districts and schools are implementing strategies to solve these challenges, but it's actually slow going. And making sure that those strategies are future proof in this rapidly changing environment is key to achievement. All learners have changed. You know, I know certainly from my own children that they are bombarded with television, mobile phones, emails. They're growing up sharing files and videos. They're sharing digital content. I know that my children will come home and they will talk via Skype and they will collaborate. They will work on homework together with their friends. In fact, by the time I finish my short introduction, you know, we will be looking at maybe over three and a half thousand hours of YouTube video will have been uploaded. More than 4.2 million tweets will have occurred. And yet we've got an education system and an education environment that is built for a totally different system. And one that the students, you know, the skills that they will need for the future and their jobs you know, how is that going to be taught with our older system? What we do know is that more technology doesn't guarantee better outcomes. So schools today are implementing technology to help get ahead of the education gap. But as we've seen from the recent OECD report, more technology doesn't automatically result in better outcomes. The good news here is though, that the OECD report does highlight that things such as strategy and training can actually result in better outcomes. And we weren't really surprised by the OECD report. And in fact, we took some advice from the report and initiated a project to try and understand exactly which practices result in better outcomes. That's what I'm going to share a little bit with you today. And it's what I'm going to come back to. And we can certainly share the full document when we have been through it. So these are just some preliminary points. But I do, do go back to my point that I'm just trying to act as a, a catalyst at the beginning of this session to really get you to think about what are the points for collaboration? So one thing that we've seen very clearly from our research is that success is enhanced when classroom technology is paired with pedagogical best practice. And you'll see as well that we've extracted both education software and education hardware or technology from this. And in fact, when we looked at our research, we sure saw, and it's not really surprising, that teaching practice pedagogy is the most important part, but that schools also need to think about software platforms that are fit for purpose and really enable multiple pedagogies. 
And then finally, we also saw that hardware should be purpose built for software, for the software, and specific to education strategies. So we looked at those, and we looked at those connections, and we're still working through this preliminary research. And this, again, is another way to look at that data. But again, what I'm saying is that good teaching practice alone will get good results. But actually, good teachers will find a way to reach the outcome they need. But what we want to do is look at how we can amplify that practice. So how can we amplify what we can see going on so that we can make it better for all schools? What are the pieces that we need to pull together? We've also looked at devices, and we've looked at what is going on with devices that the children have got that they're using, the students are using in schools. And we've seen there that a great deal of what is going on is consumption. 46% in our research we carried out at the beginning of this year is showing that 46% consume content daily in most lessons, and actually only 23% are involved in creating content, co-creation, collaboration to create content in most lessons. We are also seeing three examples here to illustrate the point that software is more closely related to success than hardware. So, one interesting point, again, to think about and to plant is that we're actually seeing that when you look at software, the results are greater than hardware in leading to success. And the next graph, and I know there's a lot here, and I'm only going to talk generally about this, and again, I can share this in detail with people after the webinar, but our Research also told us that this connected approach works. And if we look at the top right part of this chart, in that quadrant, you can see the true potential, adding great practice with enabling technology results in the best outcomes. You can see from this group that combined practice with the right technology had outstanding or good success 66% of the time. And as you can see from the results on the top left, excellent in teaching, excellence in teaching will take you so far. Great teaching, even with poor or a lack of technology, is still giving very good results. And if we look at the reverse of that on the bottom right, implementing technology in the absence of pedagogy will result in outstanding or good outcomes only 43% of the time. And that's really confirming the OECD research. And of course, the lowest results of all is when you do neither of them frequently. And we've got a lot of data from our research to back this up. And I'd be very happy to share that, post this, and we'll provide this information to you as part of the webinar pack after this webinar. Another fact that came out that I thought was particularly noteworthy was that concerns of technology being a distraction are most prevalent with less experienced educators and increase as students age. So you need to think about that. But again, these are just some of the preliminary findings from the data that we've been looking through that I'm putting in here to help when we're talking about can collaboration be taught, what is collaboration. And finally, of all the teaching and learning practices reviewed, teachers needed the most help with engaging, engaging students in collaborative practice. So our research is initially showing that this is the one where most help is needed to engage the students. And the results of this, when it's done well, can be transformational. 
So I'm walking you through, and I've walked you through some of our initial findings. I'm putting them in as catalysts for you to think about as we work through the session today. What I'd like to do now is to say that you can contact myself, and I'm sure Jim will be sharing the details of this webinar afterwards with everybody. And I'm happy to pass out the full report once it's published and to provide further information on what I've touched on. I would like to hand over now, though, to Professor Don Passy, Lancaster University. He's got one of the most impressive resumes I've ever looked at in terms of technology and what's going on in technology and learning. And I'm sure he will be more than capable of introducing himself. But if there's no initial questions, I would move on straight away to Professor Don Passy. And thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, just one question from me. The data you're mentioning is 2015 data? No, this is, um, well, it was the end of December and January 2016. So it's the most up to date data that we've got. That's great. And, and that's why I'm only really at this point still sharing preliminary results, Jim, because we're still going through what is a vast amount of data to pull out the relevant pieces. And I thought it was worth sharing because it gave some good thoughts, some good catalysts that will help in this collaboration conversation. Thank Thanks you. Very much. So, so we're, we're recording this and uh, we'll be sharing the recording. and. Um, any other information, we'll be um, uh, packaging that around the information probably on the Future Classroom Lab website. So if you'd like to pass over the, the ball to Don now. Um, how do I do that? Well, yes. that's OK. I'll, I'll make Don the presenter. He's appeared now. So, uh, Don, we're, uh, yeah, you should be able to control your slides now, Don. So if, at the top of the screen. You can't. Can you? Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I, I'm. My field is technology enhanced learning, and uh, this is an area that I've been researching for many years. And I'm. I'm particularly interested in the ways that emerging technologies have uh, influence on education and how they can influence and affect teaching and learning and what happens when they're uh, introduced into classrooms and outside classrooms. So um, what I'm going to do is to talk a little about this idea of collaborative learning because this is an area that I'm now exploring um, particularly within my own area of research. And I'll try to answer a little bit about uh, whether it can be taught. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, Mercier and Higgins, who are in uh, University of Durham in the UK, identified these four T's. And it seems to me that these are quite important, that these, there is a role for each of these within collaboration and that the four T's are all important within this concept of collaboration. And one of the key things for me is to try to work out what this means. Um, how does technology uh, affect and come into ideas of collaboration? How are teams formed? How do they work? How do teachers work with those teams and with the technology? And what sorts of tasks are involved? And these four, I think, are really quite key factors for me in terms of this whole idea of, of collaboration. Some people have looked at collaboration. It's actually not a new area that's being explored. It's been explored for, for quite a while, uh, also with technologies. So, for example, um, Stahl, Koshman and Southers said in 2006 that this was um, an approach where you're using computers or the internet, which is to do with social interaction. It's to do with sharing. It's to do with construction of knowledge. 
So this brings in this idea very strongly that a social interaction is very, very important within this whole area of collaboration. And Dillenburg, um, back in 1999, went further with that and talked about this idea of what collaboration led to. And what he was saying was that basically a collaborative outcome is something where individuals can't necessarily easily identify what their individual contributions were. But at the same time, I think importantly, what he was also saying was that individuals actually, in a sense, claim an ownership. In other words, they feel that they have been involved in that. And therefore, collaborative endeavor is not only to do with what you put in individually, but it's to do with what you feel comes out of that as a result for you individually and how you've contributed to that group. So it has these ideas of not only putting something in, but that you get something of benefit, which, is, which gains in emotional terms as well as in cognitive terms. So the social interaction is an important part of that. And indeed, in, in 1995, Gokhale said of collaborative learning that it fosters the development of critical thinking through discussion, clarification of ideas, and evaluation of others' ideas. So what was being said there really was that collaborative learning is, is to do with higher order outcomes. It's to do with higher order thinking. And therefore, this whole area of collaborative learning is, is something that's been identified as something which supports higher levels of learning, um, not just knowledge acquisition, but to do with the ways in which people critically think and how they evaluate. Okay. From my own research, I would say that in terms of the ways that technology are now being involved with collaboration, that there are three key ways in which I'm seeing the technologies supporting collaboration. And they are through visibility, i.e. they make things more visible. They open up spaces and make the ways in which contributions can happen more visible. There's inclusion. They open up the spaces so that people can be included to a greater extent. And they also open up this idea of discussion. So for me, those are, those are three key elements in the ways that technology is influencing collaboration. Um, what I'd like to do now is really talk about two studies that I've done, um, one last year and one that I'm working on this year in two different countries. And I think some of the comparison is quite interesting in, in these two. This first one is in a primary school, and it was in England. Um, it was an in-depth case study, and it was looking at how collaborative learning would, would support improvement within this particular primary school. Uh, the evidence was gathered in terms of um, management, uh, those who were, in, who were teaching, the learners, from parents and from those who were consulting. The school started off in a in a quite difficult position. It had had an inspection in 2012 that placed it in what was called a requires improvement category. So this was, was not a strong position that the school was starting at. It meant that the quality of teaching was being questioned. It was, it was even called dusty. Um, I perhaps thought of as being rather traditional. The achievements in English and mathematics were not felt to be high and teachers were often dominating in lessons. What happened was that technologies went into that school and the school focused on collaboration. So it wasn't just the technologies that they were focusing on, it was how they were using the technologies in order to build collaboration. And they built collaboration right across the school between pupils, between pupils and teachers, and also with parents. So collaborative learning was a, a complete endeavor for them. And as a result of that, uh, what they saw was that their attainment and their attendance both improved. So the level of absence decreased and the levels of reading, writing, and mathematics 
increased. And according to the teachers, according to the parents, and according to the pupils, the collaborative learning had impact there. It had effect upon that. And all of them agreed with this view that actually it was to do with things like the fact that there was more variety, the ways in which teaching were happening were different, uh, teaching was more diverse, in other words, the dust had gone to an extent, but the learning was more exposed. In other words, children weren't any longer just looking at their desks and focusing on writing in their books and listening to the teacher. Their learning was being exposed by that collaboration because they were exposing their learning to others, to other learners, to teachers, and to their parents. And that was felt to be very, very important. And the ways that teachers managed this was to think of the technologies as being a transitory medium. So they used the technologies in order to expose the learning, to create groups of learning, to create collaborative learning teams so that discussion could happen so that visibility could happen and so that individuals within those groups would be included. And then they use that transitory medium in order to move the children towards working more independently and more individually towards using a committed medium, which was more writing on paper. So they were using the technologies for the learning to be transitory, for it to be amended, for it to be shaped. And then when their thinking was shared with others, they would take them through to committing that learning onto paper. And that's important. It's important within England that that sort of individual learning can be assessed and measured. And, and those are the forms of assessment that are undertaken. And those were where those attainment changes were seen in terms of the, the outcomes in individual learning. Compared to the situation that I'm currently looking at, which is a secondary school in Germany, it's quite a different situation. And again, I'm doing an in-depth case study here. And I can give you some, some preliminary findings here, but this is not complete. But the curriculum is, is quite different from that in England. And there are important elements of collaboration actually that are in the curriculum and that are assessed by teachers. So it's a quite different situation that teachers and pupils find themselves in within, within this school in Germany. So even when the pupils are going towards their final school awards, pupils are encouraged to do presentations that involve teaching, working with their fellow pupils, and those pupils that are presenting engage the other pupils in learning activities. So collaboration is much more embedded within the curriculum for these pupils in Germany. So the technologies that, that, that are introduced, and they've only recently been introduced into the school that I'm looking at, are being introduced in a rather different way. The teachers and the pupils and the parents are not necessarily needing to focus in the same way on de developing collaborative learning, but what they're having to do is to integrate the technology into their ways of collaborative learning. And within six months, teachers and pupils are already reporting that they see that the activities are changing, that the sharing is being enhanced more, and it is leading to more collaborative thinking. So although they are already involved in that, they feel that the technologies are enhancing that. And I think that that probably goes back to something that Peter was saying earlier. So teachers are finding they, they can share work more. They can share it with pupils. They can then enable them to discuss it to a greater extent. And then that taking on board of ideas, the thinking of others, the evaluation is happening to a greater extent. And the other thing that's happening is the technologies are, are enabling this greater fluency and pace of ideas. So they can use different media to quite a, a, a different extent. Um, they can use media, they can move from text on a whiteboard to images on a whiteboard to video on a whiteboard very, very easily and quickly. 
And teachers and learners are saying how that is enabling more emotional learning to happen. And again, that's to do with the ways in which the ideas are being brought about and the sorts of ways uh, that they can bring about that learning. The inclusion is enhanced also. Uh, more pupils can be involved more readily. Uh, and that's a key measure. It's something that's measured within, within that system. They're also finding now through using the technologies that copywriting time is less needed. But there are some learners that still want to use that copywriting. So what teachers are finding is that they're having to enable that to a greater extent. They're having to think about how to cope with that so that these small numbers of pupils who gain through this idea of copywriting can still do that. So, so there are important ways in which teachers are starting to differentiate the ways in which learning is happening with those pupils and accommodating it. So I think what is happening here is the technology is, is enabling uh, the variety to happen again. This is collaboration. This is happening within a traditional classroom setting. This is where two or more small groups of pupils are collaborating together. But when they do that, they're focusing very much on the desk, on the things which are immediately in front of them. And what the technology is enabling is a different sort of collaboration. It's enabling this idea of visibility. It would be very hard for that pupil to be working in the same way if it was a chalkboard. That pupil couldn't amend. That pupil couldn't go backwards and forwards. That pupil couldn't add things and take things away as easily. It wouldn't be as visible. It's including to a greater extent because that visibility is enabling people to be included and to answer those sorts of questions and be involved in discussion. And that discussion is shaping the possibility for people to be able to take on board other people's ideas. So at the end of this session, even though the pupil at the front is working with the board and with these ideas, I don't think this pupil at the front will know exactly which of those ideas came from which person. But everyone will feel that contribution at the end and feel that what comes to an end is something that they can value and have an ownership of. So I think that the technologies are supporting that sort of learning. The teachers are clearly important in all of this, the ways that teachers operate. And I would certainly go back to what Peter was saying, and I would, and I would definitely endorse that and say that the research that I've done also shows that, the importance of the ways in which teachers are working. But there are these four T's. It is the teachers, it is the technology, it is the teams, and it is the tasks. And I think that if we want to move forward with that, those four T's are, are somehow part of the, the clues of how we need to move forward. Okay, so um, thank you for, for listening to that. I'm gonna draw this part to a close. Um, you, you may have some questions there, but um, uh, and then I'm going to uh, move over and let uh, I know uh, Marcos, who's from Smart Technologies, talk more about the technologies themselves and how they can be used in this sort of collaborative classroom uh, context. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Don. Just one question from me. Do, do you see things changing in the UK so that uh, collaborative learning is more integrated into the curriculum or is it probably going the other way or what would it take to make that happen? I think um, I think at the moment, uh, Jim, that um, the curriculum uh, means that it's very heavily dependent upon teachers and schools and school managers. And some schools are moving very definitely in the direction of moving towards more individual, um, independent learning. And others are moving more towards collaborative learning. And I think in a way it's it's separating these groups more uh, rather than leading everybody towards the possibilities of variety. I think it's, it's tending to polarize the position at the moment. Some are integrating it and, and some are not. And so I, I think that that's the sort of pattern that we're seeing at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
So Anoa, would you like to tell us a little bit about Smart Amp now? Yes. Um, okay, so I hope everybody can see me and hear me clearly. Yes. Okay, so I cannot access to the other presentation, Jim, do I have? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a little bit slow, but it's, yeah, the presenter. Oh, okay, okay, it's coming, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, I'm going to share my screen, actually, because what I want to show you is Smart Am in, act in action. I'm going to show you uh, my screen. Great. So, um, um, one of the things that um, we have been talking is that, and Peter mentioned, is not only the technology, is also the teachers and, and the, the methodology what, what drives this collaboration. And we are the SMAR, we, we, have, um, we have been working in this software, SMARAM, that you can see here, that is a digital canvas. Uh, let me go to the different um, spaces of SMARAM that I have here so that I can show you. I'm not going to take too much time because we have a teacher with us today and I want him to share with you what he has seen are the benefits of using SMARAM for this collaboration. So uh, Peter talked that most um, is the software, what it drives more than the hardware um, to this collaboration. And with SMARAM, Basically, what we have is the tool that allows the teacher this flexibility to move through these different learning environments or different methodologies. Uh, SMARAM is a cloud-based software that allows teachers and students co-creation and collaboration in real time at any time, anywhere, and also in any device because it's cloud-based. So, um, um, it allows different collaborative projects, as you are going to see with Jorgen uh, in the project that he wants to share with you. Allows for real insights for teachers, flexible approaches in the different um, learning methodologies. So SMARAM is, is really good for project-based learning, student-centered learning, flipped classroom, problem solving. It is for, good also for individual work, but also for collaborative learning. Um, student -led learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning. As you can see, I'm moving here uh, through um, the presentation that I have here in SMARAM that is, instead of being like traditional software in slides or pages, it is um, an infinite canvas where I can move and, and add different type of content. Students and teachers can co-create digital content adding different type of of, of rich content like images, YouTube videos, PDFs, web browsers, notebook activities if they are using smart notebook software. And this encourages student-led learning where the students can create their own learning, can create their own content, but also uh, they can share and collaborate. A teacher has the ability to share the workspaces with the different students that are in the classroom and organize those students by groups um, that can be set up randomly or by default by the teacher. And then the students have the ability to communicate through the chat so they can send messages to all the other students in their groups. And um, a teacher has all the time the view of what's going on in the um, in the workspace that is the shared workspace. So the evaluation is not only the traditional test that we have it, and we can add a test and have the results of uh, and also the report of how the how is the progress of the students, but we also have the qualitative and quantitative um, evaluation of their contributions from the students to the project. So we are not evaluating only at the end, we are evaluating all the process and the collaboration itself with this object attribution so teacher can see who has uh, contributed what uh, in the workspace. So instant, instant, um, instant view of what is the progress of each student in the classroom. 
um, is a great tool also. I want to also mention, as, as Don also mentioned, this um, component of social, component of the collaboration, and Peter also mentioned this, uh, the 21st century skills and traits for the students, uh, the teachers' opinions from this, how is Madame supposed these different learning traits, like, for example, uh, project management, questioning, turn taking. So, for example, we have um, here one teacher from the USA saying the students working on the same project, whether it is at the same time or not, have to determine who is going to do what and when into the project. So that allows uh, to better communicate and, and, and improve the tone taking from the students. Negotiation, working in the same workspace, students need to negotiate and divide their work. Decision making, speaking and listening skills, questioning, project management. So um, students should be able to create their own project areas whether, uh, where they can separate by folders and be able to notify the teacher of their updated projects, class communication, team, team working. So this madam leads itself to team building and so students how to work in a digital environment. Self-organized learning, students are able to choose different ways of sharing their own content in SMARAM through diagrams, links, pictures, writing, drawing, etc. Presenting um, abilities, concluding and reflecting, negotiation. And I'm going to read all the, all the comments from the teachers, but yes, um, as, a sum, as a summary, I want just to comment. SMARAM provides insight into progress and contribution from students, encourages natural, intuitive learning, integrates rich digital content, fosters true collaboration and works with the 16 technologies supporting all teaching styles. So um, this is the tool. Now I'm going to pass over, uh, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to uh, Jorgen. So um, Jorgen Holmberg, he is a smart exemplary educator. He's a teacher in Finland. Um, a special education teacher, and he's going to share with us a great global collaborative pro project that involves five different countries, uh, six teachers from five different countries, uh, in which their students are collaborating and working together, no matter where they are located. And, um, and that's a great, great example of what we have been talking during the whole webinar. So I'm, going, I'm passing over to you, Jorgen. Yeah, Jorgen is the presenter. Now, before you go, Anoa, thanks for that. In terms of the professional development that teachers need so that they can, you know, really start to, to use SmartAM, what, what, what's your finding? We can ask Jorgen as well, his experience, but in, in most countries, how much professional development do teachers need in order to get the grips for the software? Yeah, do we have, uh, Peter can answer this better than me because he's the head of uh, professional training team at SMART, but I can say um, one, one point is SMARAM is super easy to use. It's very intuitive uh, for teachers and students, and you can see students uh, using, never been using SMARAM, being able to use it in five minutes, knowing how to do everything. Uh, but we also have different training courses and models. Some of them are for free in the smart learning space. We also have um, a smart ed to ed YouTube channel where we have hundreds of videos created by teachers for teachers where they can see it. And also in the same as Madam um, webpage, you have the support and help where you can go to the tutorial. So it's a lot of, a lot of, um, training materials and resources for teachers. Okay, thanks very much. So over to you, Jorgen. Thank you. So can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? All right, yes. good. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Smart the Global Project, and it's really a global project. And thank you for the introduction also. Now this global project is a collaboration between special education classes. So in fact, all of us who are in this project, we are special needs teacher or special ed class teachers, all of us. And uh, our students 
they have a different they are different kind of students they can have hearing loss visually visually impaired asperger some of them have social challenges uh, challenges like collaboration and negotiations and also learning challenges our students are the youngest are about 8 years old and i think the oldest are about 15 now on this picture on the left, you see the whole bunch of us. We met up in Calgary last summer, and we we started off, kicked off this this uh, project there. And we are it's a little bit small. This text, but it's uh, me, Jorin Holmbe from Sipo in Finland, and uh, Lotta Ramqvist from Örebro in Sweden, Stacy Kinsel Gelbaum from Atlanta, Georgia, the USA and Carla Pina Vieira from South Africa, Brianna Owens from Albert, no, I have to think, how did you say it now again? Was it Alberki, Albuquerque, Albuquerque, in New Mexico, the USA, and Stefan Schwarz from Potsdam in Germany. So we are the special ed teachers who are within this project. Uh, ah, we also have our mascot, it's also called Smarty, and he is, of course, Canadian. And one little extra thing is that we send him by snail mail. That's normal letters from one place to another. And right now he is in South Africa. Now, there are more important people than us in this project, and that's our students. And one really important thing here is, of course, to talk to the other classes about what's different, to tell the students about what's different, but also what is the same. And now we have, we try to do things live. For instance, in Europe, we, we have some live sessions between ourselves, but uh, between me and my friend Bri Brianna from New Mexico, there is a time difference of nine hours. So. When we collaborate, when we talk to each other, which we do every now and then, we have to do it my time on Sundays in the evening, because that's the only time when we all have time to talk to each other. But the students, these are my, a group of my students. So we made videos where we greeted each other. And in Sweden, they made also a very nice video with sign languages. And this is from New Mexico. And talking about different things, now, uh, very important for our students is they are all special ed stu students. So, uh, but this is very important that they feel connected to students here. They recognize them. They even recognize some of the students from Georgia when they saw them on a, on a picture later. And one thing that they looked at when they watched this video from New Mexico was that Hey, there is almost only sand over there. And then we thought that, well, what's uh, strange about our country? Well, we still have a lot of snow and lots of forests. So that's kind of strange for many other people. So that's things that we have been working on also. And uh, let's go and see how we have done our work. These are two workspaces. And the main idea, I will not go into the technical details here, but I hope you have a little bit bigger picture than I have. But if you look at the, this workspace on the left, this is the very first one that we have. These are active workspaces, which means that every now and then there is someone who has not done their part. And we don't, we have very many active uh, active projects or workspaces, which means that whenever you want to, you can take one of the workspaces and work with your class. And then they do their work, and then we send it back and somebody else has done. This was the presentation of our, our own uh, schools and the surroundings, and we also had a map here. So these were the teachers, so we are the teachers there, and then we have put in pictures and videos about our own place where we come from and try to show what's, what is similar for us and what is different for us. 
uh, in this project, it's not so much about learning facts. Of course, they will know very much about some parts of the USA and some part of Germany and so on. But uh, the main idea, as I said, it's to connect them. It's to, to collaborate, to, to feel also that they are connected to, that they have someone somewhere else who perhaps have the same, same challenges in life. They look very much the same and still they live in a very different place. We just realized, in fact, we are the only students in my school who live close to the sea. So now we have taken lots of sea pictures that we are going to send on a very new workspace. Now, uh, this workspace on the right, that is in fact, the idea here was that we are, are working on, on um, how it looks, how our countries, how our places look in the months of February and March. And if you live in the desert of New Mexico, it's quite different than here in Finland. And this is, of course, something that we work on, and then we can look at what the other students have been doing. So in that way, we also learn from each other. And uh, the Americans had done very nice videos about the uh, it's, it's a weather program that they made for us. And that was very nice. Uh, we can work as we did here. We work the whole class together, or as we have done here, uh, we have shared the workspace to different groups. And uh, so I have had a few students working with, uh, well, this is in fact the whole year that we have been writing about. So this is the whole year in Finland. And then we send this workspace uh, so that the other schools can start from where we stopped and continue with this workspace. They just can edit a little bit and then they put in their own material. So that is how we collaborate globally right now. Uh, our project has got some attention. In fact, uh, we have been in several papers in the USA and we have also been invited to ISTE as presenters. And we try to gather everything that we have have got to, so that, that we can also share with each other the publicity that this project has, has received. Uh, I asked my colleagues that what are the results of the project with Smart Amp and what are the benefits? Now, my students, uh, they have mostly, many of them have great social challenges. And as I said, one of the biggest challenges is collaborate, negotiate, having to take tough decisions, having to work. Then, of course, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's so much big, better than it could be. So, Brianna Owens from New Mexico, USA, she wrote that regardless of ability, communicate, communi communicate difficulties or other differences, Students are able to really contribute while learning in real time through real world application. And I have said the same thing many times that many students have problems to collaborate with the student sitting next to them. Today, one girl said, I don't want to collaborate with this guy, although she doesn't have any problems to collaborate with someone in South Africa or in the USA. It's much easier to collaborate with uh, a student sitting in another country. Stacy Gelbaum from Georgia. She writes that using smart technology in the classroom encourages active learning and integration among students. Smart AMP especially helps students with autism or other learning disability, disabilities engaged and excited, making learning fun. Stefan Schwarz from Potsdam in Germany writes that we provide our students with opportunities to share our world with new friends. They embark on new adventures with the help of technology. We give our students real world accomplishments. And Carla Pena Vieira from South Africa. Her students are deaf 
And uh, we, they also use iPads in conjunction with the board, which makes learning even more visual. They are so excited to be in, the, in this global collaboration with all these great people around the world. And last but, last but not least, Lotta Ramqvist from Örebro in Sweden. The students work within their curriculum. They produce and know that they are real students in the other that they are real students in the other end reading their products the work can be about can be about learning about each other's countries cultures or traditions the idea is also to get to know students in other countries who have similar disabilities the students also appreciate the interactive techniques education becomes so much more alive when they can write read and collaborate in real time. And we talked about how easy this program is. Well, I think we are the proof that we can work with smart and and we can work globally and collaborate. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jorgen. Uh, in, in, in terms of your, your students, what happens next after this project? Will you continue to collaborate? Oh. Oh, you know, I have one class here. Mm -hmm. Next year, I will move to a new building with my class, and we will have two languages in the, we, under the same roof. We have Finnish-speaking and Swedish-speaking people in the same school. And I, my dream and my plan is to put all the classes in these kind of projects. And we are about seven, eight, so we will just expand. And we will see what, that, what happens then. So we will try to get more and more special ed classes within these kind of, of, of projects because we want them also to feel that people care about them. They want to feel important. Okay, thank you. So uh, if anyone has any questions they'd like to put to any of the speakers, you can post them in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, take questions now. Uh, if they're not, I have a question for, for Peter. I mean, looking at Jorgen's project, it, it looks like an ideal project uh, to be sort of transplanted to something like e-twinning. Do you have any plans to do something with uh, the e-twinning initiative or schools in Europe? And it seems SmartApp would be a great platform for that. I, I, I think, Jim, you're absolutely right. It, it is an excellent platform, and that's certainly something I know of and I can talk about and see how we can make that happen. So I'm very happy to explore that. I, I know that we talked at the beginning that we're very happy to take the conversation about Smart Amp and talk with people who've been on the webinar and to see how we can expand it to a larger group so that they can see how collaboration can be taught using that particular solution. Okay, thank you very much. Tommaso, you've, you've put a, a question in the chat to me privately. Could you explain that a little bit more? Has collaboration among students from the same group improved as well? What do you mean by that? For the last presentation more specifically, so uh, it was easier for students to collaborate with uh, students from other countries during the program. Uh, after the, the projects, were they more eager also to collaborate with their peers in the classroom? That was my question, basically. Thank you. So, Jorgen, it was a good question. <laughs> it's a good question that I think about every day because, as I said, I have lots of social lots of challenges. Now, I do think that that it's getting better when they are working with this, although they are working in in different paces. But my my view is that it works so much better because. Many of them can use, they can use so many different tools also when they use this. So they can, they can show their strength, so to say. So I would say uh, it's, not, it's not from black to white, if you understand what I mean, but it's getting better also in the class. Okay, thank so that's you. That's my answer. Thank you, Jorgen. Okay, well, we're, we're dead on time. We're just a minute over time. So if I can ask our speakers to turn on their, their videos again.
Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Don, Peter, Anoa and Jorgen for, for joining us today. I think we've had a very good overview of some of the, the, the key issues in collaborative learning. And it's been great to have a, a quick insight into SmartAMP and how it's being used. So uh, thank you very much to all our speakers today. Th thank you to all of you who joined the, the webinar. Uh, there will be a recording and we'll post that and we'll notify uh, all of the other policymakers and future classroom labs and ambassadors who were invited to take part today. Thank, so thank, thank you. I know it. Do you yeah. want to say something? Yeah, I just want to do it. I know you were uh, out of time, but if you can pass to the last slide where I put all my contact details in case uh, some of the um, attendees wants to um, do a small um, pilot. So in the next slide, yeah. So if you, if any of the participants wants to uh, do a smart and pilot with us and, and test it and, and do a large school or region project or implementation. Um, please contact me. Uh, you have my contact details there and we could have a further conversation on how to make it this possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jim, for organising. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.